Our scripture lesson this morning comes from the book of Acts. I'll be reading from the fourth chapter, verses 32 through 37. Listen now for the word of God for you. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to anyone who had need. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. Let us pray. Dear God, in the midst of the confusion and the clutter and the chaos that surrounds our lives, Help us to feel your presence near to us today. Slow us down, if only for a little while. Draw us up onto your lap and hold us close, even as you whisper to us those wonderful words that lead to life. Speak, Lord, for we, your servants, are listening. Amen. Well, on my bookshelf at home, there sits a book entitled Grandpa Was a Preacher, written by a young man who describes summer spent with his grandmother and his grandfather, who was a small town Methodist minister. One of the stories that I've come to really appreciate over the years is the story that this young author tells about his grandfather and a woman from his grandfather's church named Mrs. Jones. Mrs. Jones was, by all accounts, an incredibly opinionated member of Grandpa's congregation. We don't have any of those at Community Church, who delighted in telling Grandpa how to run his church and handle his business. We don't have any of those either. She was one of those people who knew everything about everything, always talking, never listening, always questioning everything grandpa did or didn't do. Why'd you preach on that? Why don't you visit so-and-so? Her existence was one critical question after another, after another. One Saturday morning, grandpa spotted Mrs. Jones making her way up the walk to his house, no doubt on her way to grill him. As grandpa saw her come and he said quickly to his wife, I'm going upstairs. I don't have time for her. Tell her anything. Just get rid of her. I'll be down when she's gone. When Grandpa went upstairs and he studied, worked on his sermon for close to an hour and a half. He thought to himself, she is bound to be gone by now. And so he started down the stairs. And as he did so without thinking, he hollered out the question, honey, is the old windbag gone? About that time, Grandpa turned the landing on the stairs and spotted his wife and Mrs. Jones just standing there. Quickly and smoothly, his wife said, yes, dear, the old windbag is gone, and in the meantime, Mrs. Jones has stopped by to see you. Now, as always, thank God for those preacher's wives who keep preachers out of hot water, and thank God for a good preaching pivot point. How many of you have a Mrs. Jones as a part of your life? Or more to the stepping on toes point, how many of you plead guilty to having some Mrs. Jones living inside of you? There was a theologian named Gregory of Nyssa, one of the early church fathers of the fourth century, and he painted this wonderful word picture of two kinds of people, balcony people and basement people. This is what he writes. At horse races, the spectators, intent on victory, shout to their favorites in the contest. From the balcony, they incite the rider to keener effort, 
urging the horses on while leaning forward and flailing the air with their outstretched hand instead of a whip. Now, while that's a keen observation, it makes me think that Gregory of Nyssa spent a surprising amount of time at the horse track for an early church father. Nevertheless, he takes this image of spectators in the balcony, and he goes on to say, I want to be doing the same thing myself for all of you, my most valued sisters and brothers. While you're competing in the divine race, I want to encourage you vigorously. I want to encourage you vigorously. I think Gregory is on to something. Think about the people in your life who have been your balcony people. When you're with them, they just fill you up. As you run life's marathon, they cheer you on. When you fall, they help you up. They encourage you vigorously. But then you have some other people in your life. Gregory says, they drain you of life. They constantly criticize. They are basement people because they bring you down. They are the Mrs. Joneses, the dream squashers, the fault finders, the people who punch a hole in your oxygen tube. The truth of the matter is that all of us have the potential to be basement people for others because there is a basement person that lurks inside each one of us, which is a truth you see that leads me to my first question of the day. Which word would those who know you best use to describe you? Are you prone to the balcony or to the basement? We meet the patron saint of balcony people for the first time in the fourth chapter of the book of Acts, in the lesson I read to you just a few minutes ago. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, sold a field he owned. He brought the money. He put it at the apostles' feet. Because of that description, we get a sense early on that Joseph is a balcony guy who is concerned with building up folks. Here's some money. Use it for whatever you need. The encouraging spirit that the disciples see in Joseph is so infectious the disciples say, Joe is not an adequate name for this guy. Sorry to all the Joes out there. We're going to give him a new name. We're going to call him Barnabas, the son of encouragement. And from then on, whenever he hears his name, he thinks, that's who I am, an encourager. That's who God calls me to be. Now, Barnabas disappears early in chapter 5. The next time we see him, is in Acts chapter 9. And as Acts 9 begins, we learn of a man named Saul who has been terrorizing the followers of Jesus. As you might remember, Saul has a come-to-Jesus meeting on the road to Damascus, and he experiences this dramatic conversion. Saul repents. He trusts Jesus with his life. He gets a new name, Paul, but immediately he runs into a problem. When he gets to Jerusalem, he tries to join up with the disciples. They're all scared to death of him. He's persecuted, imprisoned, killed their husbands, wives, brothers, sisters, and friends. No one's going to touch him with a 10-foot pole. So they send Barnabas to check this guy out. And we get another glimpse of the great gift that balcony people possess Balcony people believe that with God's help, you can change. They don't let who you were yesterday limit who you might be today or who you might become tomorrow. They don't hang the past continually over your head. They don't laugh at your dreams. After getting to know him, Barnabas is willing to take a risk on Paul. He goes to his brothers and his sisters and he says, I'll vouch for the guy. I'm convinced of the change. He can be trusted. Because of Barnabas, the disciples embrace Paul. We're told in Acts 9, 28, Paul stayed with them. He moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. So here's the second question of the day for you to ponder. What 
would have happened to Paul if he hadn't had Barnabas? Paul just happens to go on and change the entire world. But it only happened because of Barnabas. The transformation of much of the Eastern and Western world came about because one balcony person gave Paul the wonderful gift of starting over. And guess what, my friends? You can do that for somebody. You can be an encourager. You can help somebody start over. You can be a Barnabas. So here is my challenge to you this morning. We have become a culture that loves to complain about, to whine about, to find fault with just about everything. Why didn't you do this? Why did you do that? So what I'm asking you to do this week comes in the form of a little experiment. I want you to take a hard look at your life and figure out how you can become a balcony guy or a balcony gal. Last week, we learned to see differently. Today, we learn how to speak differently. It's time for us to quit criticizing, to quit complaining, to quit gossiping, to start being Barnabases. People will be drawn to faith in Christ through encouragement, not discouragement. And it's within your power, within the power of the Holy Spirit that lives in you, for you to be an encourager this week. So I want you to single out an individual, maybe even a few people at work, at school, in your neighborhood, maybe even in your own home, and find a creative way to encourage them. Write a letter, speak a word of blessing, fund a project for them, something tangible that lets them know how much you believe in them. The fact of the matter is that we make Christianity so complex when it couldn't be any simpler. Being a Barnabas is about being loved and encouraged by God and then giving that love and encouragement to other people by the words you speak. Nothing can so seriously compromise or strengthen or weaken our Christian witness as the words we speak. The author of the book of Proverbs says in chapter 18, death and life are in the power of the tongue. Words really do have the power of life and death. They go so much deeper than we know. And sometimes it's the words that are never spoken that can do the greatest damage of all. One of my minister friends got a call one evening from a woman whose family had attended a church he had served a few years earlier. This woman asked the minister to visit her brother in the hospital. I'll let him take the story from there. She asked me to visit her brother, he said, and although I knew her family fairly well, I was surprised at the request because I never even knew she had a brother. I found out he was dying of AIDS. He'd been sick for quite some time. He had gone for a year without any conversation at all with his parents and had decided that his primary goal was to die unnoticed and alone. Finally, his sister found out that he was ill, convinced him to go to the hospital. And when I visited him, he spoke of wanting life to just be over because he was so depressed. He made peace with God, however. He asked me to baptize him, and so I did with his sister watching just a few days before he died. His parents visited him once in the hospital, but they would not acknowledge the reason he was there. His mother, the woman who had brought his body into the world, refused to touch that same body as it was about to leave this world. Her primary concern was to make sure that in any public records, the cause of death would not be listed as AIDS so that no one would know. And so he died without ever receiving from his mom or dad the words that might have helped to heal his soul. Every interaction we have 
with another person affords us the chance to bless somebody's life, the chance to speak a word that heals their soul, the chance to say what really matters. So what I want to do briefly in the time that's left today is to walk through five words and phrases that can mean life to somebody, five words that can breathe life into a relationship. We are breathing life or we're breathing death into relationships all the time, every single day. And relationships that are getting strong and are healthy, lots of life gets breathed through life-giving words. I want you to know I'm not giving this message just for you to think, well, those are some interesting thoughts, Bob. That is not this kind of message. I want you to actually do what I'm getting ready to say. You can apply most all of what we're talking about into relationships that matter the most to you, but we're just going to talk about five really simple words. They come at junctures of ordinary life multiple times every day. Here we go. Number one, goodbye. When you're together and then you're getting ready to leave, there's always kind of a tender little moment. Before you say goodbye each morning to your spouse or to your significant other or to your kid, make sure you know at least one thing about their day. Just that simple. Just know one thing. Proverbs says, wise men store up knowledge, but the mouth of a fool invites ruin. The wise store up knowledge, and knowledge about people is one of the most important kinds of knowledge there is. The Bible says a lot about it. It is a brilliant truth. What you know about indicates what you care about. What you know about reveals where your heart is. Whatever you prize, it might be the stock market, it might be money, it might be surfing or a hobby or your vocation. Whatever you care about, you think about it, you study it, you remember it, you pay attention. Whatever I know about is a litmus test that indicates what I care about. In healthy relationships, people have a deep familiarity with each other's worlds. In unhealthy relationships, there are big gaps, these large areas of ignorance. Simply by coming to know more, I can come to care more. So this week, make goodbye a word of life. Every day before you say goodbye to each other, make sure you've learned one thing that will be happening in that person's day. It is just that simple, that word right there, Goodbye is a word that can breathe life. Number two, hello, kind of the opposite word. When you see, when you greet somebody and you've been away from them for a while, that is a tender moment that you take for granted. Our world, life itself, has a way of beating people up. All kinds of people end up lying by the side of the road. Words have the power to heal their spirit. I read this tidbit a few years back. I found it to be so incredibly poignant. Deborah Tannen is a neurolinguist at USC. She studies communication. She tells a story about her aunt, an elderly woman in her 80s. She met a man. This relationship kind of blossomed. It was friendship. Then it became love. She was telling Deborah about a conversation she had had with this guy on the phone where she talked to him about a luncheon she'd been to the previous day with her friend. He was asking her about that luncheon, and she said he asked her, what did you wear? Deborah said that her aunt, 85-year-old woman, got big tears in her eyes and said, do you know how long it has been since anybody asked me what I wore? Why in the world should that matter, what somebody wore? Well, there's a great verse in Scripture where Jesus says, God has numbered the hairs on your head. That is not a statement about God's data processing. That is how much God cares. When you love someone, you notice and you care. This week, mirror the love of God just by saying, Hello. Number three, tell me more. 
This is vital in relationships. Proverbs 18 verse 2 says, Fools care nothing for thoughtful discourse. All they do is run off at the mouth. Proverbs 18 13 says, Answering before listening is both stupid and rude. There are few gifts you can give to a human being that communicate value more than your time and your attention. So use this phrase at some point this week. Tell me more. How is your life going? How do you think the kids are doing? Tell me more. That becomes a word of life. Number four, thank you. How beautiful those two words are, how tragic it sometimes is, even in friendships, even in families, even in a marriage. Hours, days, weeks, months go by. The only time we ever hear thank you is from somebody who is selling us something. The assignment here is to find some way to express appreciation or admiration every day. Proverbs 15.30 says this, Good news gives health to the bones. That is literally true. Our bodies actually respond for better or for worse to the words that we hear. I'm going to give you an exercise for this one. Again, you can do this if you're married or if you're not. You can do this with a good friend. Write down one quality you admire in someone close to you, just one. Loving, joyful, brave, smart, generous, calm, patient, constructive, ingenious, organized. Think of one concrete example that illustrates that characteristic and just tell that person this week one thing. One quality, one concrete illustration of it. Tell them, thank you. I'm sure you can guess the last phrase, love you. How many times have I heard those words? They never get old. Love you. There are all kind of ways to say those words. Take five minutes a day. Tell the people in your life you love them. That's why you're on this planet. You and I, we get all caught up in what's the next rung on the ladder? What can I do to be successful? What's tomorrow's plan? And we forget that it's just all about love. That's all it is. The author River Jordan has written a book that I've mentioned to you before, a book that in many ways has changed my life. It's entitled Praying for Strangers. It's a transformative way of cultivating an awareness of the nudges of the Holy Spirit that come our way every single day if we just pay attention. In the closing pages of Praying for Strangers, River writes this. I've been thinking about last words lately, about the way we pass strangers all day, passing words back and forth out of common courtesy or out of general irritation. I've been thinking about how any of these words could be our last. Then, of course, I consider husbands and wives and mothers and fathers and friends, the people in our lives that we live with every day, still not saying the things that matter so much. What if this is the last chance we have to leave an imprint on a person's heart? What is the perfect phrasing that says it all? And then I heard them, she said, the perfect last words. They were graced upon me by my friend the last time I ever saw him alive. Before I knew it, a few days later, he was in a coma. And then he was gone. I knew he had taken a turn for the worse, but I wasn't expecting his leaving, not that soon. I might have said some things, some different things but I think about his words to me and the way that he delivered them. He cut to the chase. He dropped the pretense and the pleasantries that exist between even the closest of friends. He didn't even talk about himself, which in healthier times he did a lot. This was one of the things that we always joked about, but he was a visionary and an artist and a talented man. He had a lot to say, a lot he wanted to share. But in the end, He had only one thing, the words he left behind, 
the final ones he bestowed upon those who dared to draw near. Again and again, as years go by, I turn those words over like precious stones and bring them to the surface of my mind. He said them with an honesty that only comes when that sheet of time hanging between mortal and immortal fades into the light. I love you so much, he said. You would have to have heard him say it to know how much he meant those words, how much he felt them, how much I feel them still. Now I find myself praying for strangers everywhere, speaking to them during the day, remembering them in the night, and I'm wondering, what if those words, those few words spoken, were my final words here on earth? Or maybe the last words they received. What if this stranger, this one right here in front of me today, is one of the most important people in my life? Or that I'm the last living contact they'll receive? I'm not being morbid, just factually curious. It happens. If these are my final words or the last words they hear, then perhaps leaning forward, pausing for just a moment, whispering to someone, today, you're the stranger I'm praying blessings for, is not such a long, horrible, frightful step to make. May all of our final words to friends and foes, to strangers one and all, be so divine. Community Church Congregational, you will have your opportunity today to speak the divine words that give life in the grocery store, the restaurant, heck, maybe in your own living room. Every day, everyone you know faces life with eternity on the line. Life has a way of beating people down. Every life needs a cheering section. Every life needs a shoulder to lean on. Every life needs to hear a voice saying, don't give up. Will you be that voice? Here's the Barnabas challenge. Stop complaining. Stop criticizing. Ain't nobody got time for that. You have the power of life and death within you. It's up to you which you will choose. Will your words hurt or will they heal? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.